go. Yes, here we go. So I'm going to talk about Scram authentication. Um, Scram is a new authentication method. Uh, so authentication method is the thing that you put in your pghba.conf file to the column that says method. Um, there are a few built-in authentication methods or existing authentication methods in Postgres. Uh, today I'm mostly, mostly going to talk about the password-based ones. There's what we call the plain text password authentication. That's what you get if you just put password in your hba.conf file. There used to be, many, many, many years ago, one called crypt. Uh, I think it was removed around 7.3 or something. Uh, but it used to be there. It was another password-based authentication method. Then there's MD5, which is the most common one that people use uh, for passwords with Postgres. And now we have this new one called Scram SHA-256. Uh, there are other authentication methods. There are, there's Kerberos. Uh, there's, uh, uh, you can use SSL certificates for authentication. You can use PAM uh, to look up the passwords from, from something else or, or do whatever you want, or radius. But I'm, I'm today, I'm, I'm talking about the password-based ones, not SSL certificates or, or Kerberos. So just a quick recap, what is, how does password authentication work? Uh, the plain text one is the simplest one to begin with, so let's begin with that. The, the way it works is that the server asks the client, please give me your password. And the client says, OK, here's my password. The server looks it up, compares the password with what, the, what you have in, in the database. And if it matches, it, it says, OK, cool, you can, you, can, you can log in. And then you can start running your queries. Uh, obviously, plain this password, have some, there's some issues with them, which is why people usually try to avoid them. Uh, if, anyone, if anyone is uh, running like a wire shark or something to look at, look at, your, look at the traffic, uh, they can see your password, and then they can use that to, to log in. Uh, that's not a problem if you're using SSL. However, then you need to use, you, you must use the certificates and have the certificate authority files and such installed on the server so that otherwise there could be a man in the middle attack, which means that there is someone is faking and pretending to be the right server. So when you connect to that, you, you'll give away your password. Uh, so no one really uses the plain password authentication um, in, as such. But it's worth noting that RADIUS, LDAP, uh, PAM, I think the BSD authentication method, which is, which is new, uh, they all actually use the plain text password authentication on the wire. So to the client, the client doesn't know if it's RADIUS or LDAP or, or PAM or whatever. What the client sees is just plain text password. Give me your password. So to address some of these problems, uh, MD5 authentication was added a long time ago. Uh, the way that works is that instead of sending the plaintest password, the, it's a challenge response uh, scheme where the server says, there's a, there's a run, it gives the client some random bytes. It's called the salt. And the client then calculates this MD5 hash using the password and the username and the, and the salt. And then the server compares that with the, uh, with the hash or password that's stored in the database and allows the login or not. Now, there's some problems with MD5 as well. Uh, first of all, MD5 hashes are pretty fast to calculate. So this is, it's pretty easy to launch a dictionary attack on MD5. I did, I did some quick testing on my laptop with a single core. I could calculate about 7 million MD5 hashes per second. There's probably more sophisticated hardware to do that or you know, use GPUs or, or whatever that, that you could get even much, much, much more. But it means that you can guess a hell of a lot of passwords per second, and you really need to have strong passwords if you rely on that. Uh, you can work around that if you always make sure that you have long passwords and you generate them randomly. That's not a problem. Uh, but most people who choose, if you let your users to choose a password, chances are that it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall for a dictionary attack these days, almost certainly. Um, another problem with the MD5 authentication method is that the salt that we use in the challenge response, it's only four bytes. Uh, it's a 32-bit integer, which isn't very much, actually, uh, for, for what we use it for. Um, it there's only four billion unique values, and if, 
if someone is observing your logins and they can see, say, 100 million logins or a billion logins, uh, the next time and record all of those challenges and responses, they can just use the value that you recorded to, to log in. So this is, th this is another problem with MD5. Um, the third problem, which most people don't probably realize, is that the, the hash that we store in the database in, in PG out, uh, out ID table, uh, although we store an MD5 hash, you don't need to reverse that hash to log in. It's as good as a plain text password. Uh, because if you look at the computation we have up there, the, what, the server, what we saw in the server is the MD5 of, pass, of, of password and username. And then uh, the client needs to calculate that and, uh, and add the salt there. Uh, but if you already have that MD5 hash of the password and the username, you can just use that to log in. You don't need to know the original password at all. The hash is just as good as knowing the password. Uh, so even though it's a, it's a hash, it's not, a ha it's not secure in the same way that, say, uh, etc slash shadow hash, the hashes there are in, in, on Unix systems usually. Um, there, are, there are some other issues with MD5 authentication method. method. The, because we include the username in the hash that you have to calculate, if you rename your user, the old hash isn't good anymore. <laughs> so, uh, so if you if you do alter user rename, we currently just reset your uh, your password if it was an MD5 hash, which you know that's not a big deal, but it's one more little annoying uh, little feature of this. Another thing is that you can't use the DB underscore user uh, namespace feature, which might be useful for for some some people. I mean, it's a bit of a hack. I don't know if anyone would use it anyway, or at least not very many people, but it's another little annoyance that it just doesn't work with MD5 authentication. It's, the reason is the same, because we include the username in, in, the, in the hash. The third issue is that uh, MD5 has a bit of a PR problem. Um, <laughs> we get regular complaints or reports from people on the mailing list saying, you know, you shouldn't be using MD5, because that's insecure. and. Uh, well, the truth is that it's, it's okay for the purposes that we use it. As a hash algorithm, uh, we don't rely on collision resistance and all the attacks on MD5 are, are that you can create collisions. But that's not actually a problem the way we use MD5 in the authentication. But nevertheless, it has a bad reputation. So it's always a, it's kind of awkward that you have to explain in a way that, yeah, 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 we know, you know MD5, it's broken, we know. But it's actually okay the way we use it. Uh, I would rather not have to explain that. So, because of all these issues with MD5, uh, uh, Scram comes to the rescue. It stands for Solid Challenge Response Authentication Mechanism. So, it's similar to MD5 in that it's, it's a challenge response uh, thing. Uh, to be precise, Postgres implements the Scram SHA-256 version of that, the original Scram specification used the SHA-1 hash algorithm, which is, that would be perfectly fine. But since we're implementing this from scratch now, we might as well go with the even more modern hash algorithm. So that's why. Um, the Scram authentication looks a little bit like this. Uh, first, the client sends the server a random bit of uh, uh, random string. It can be variable length. Note that it's a lot longer than four bytes that we used with MD5. and uh, the server will, will add its own little piece of random uh, bytes to that, and it will also send the salt and an, what we call an iteration count to the client. And then I left out the details of what the, what, what the next steps are, but the, in a sense, the client calculates a, a SHA-256 hash from that information and the password. And then there's this last step where the, the server also gives the also computes a hash of the password and the, the random strings and passes it back to the client. And the client can use that hash to verify that, okay, the server also actually knew the password. What does, what does does check that. <coughs> does, so the, if it doesn't match, it will reject the connection. Uh, that doesn't help you. The reason is that although libq will check that if you do scram authentication, but there is currently no option to tell libq that you must use Scram authentication. 
So if you connect to a, a fake server, the fake server can just not do Scrum authentication. Uh, it can actually ask you for the plain text password and the client will happily give it away. Uh, so there's some further development to be done there. If the server didn't know the password, then it couldn't compute that, that last Sometimes step. You delegate the password through, so what would happen then? Well, you don't. Uh, if, if you try to delegate, that would be considered a man in the middle attack. No, no, no. Uh, you authenticate with some third party, like a LLAP server. That's common. Uh, with, L, with an LLAP server, the way this would work with an LLAP server hasn't been implemented. The way it would work with an LLAP server is that. Uh, well, currently, if you use LDAP, then it will do password, plain text password authentication from the client to the server. Um, but the way this could work, and this is a, I'll come back to this on the last slide, uh, but you could, the, ser the Postgres server could fetch the Scram hash from the LDAP. Okay, just delegate so, the whole thing. Yeah, so instead of just storing it in the Postgres database, <laughs> you could fetch it from the LDAP server. Well, it hasn't been. <coughs> Depends on how you set up the LDAP server. Yeah. Like if you want to use LDAP, you turn on SSL and use the LDAP module. Yeah, I'm not very familiar with LDAP, but I, I believe there's two ways to use LDAP for authentication in Postgres currently. One is that if you take the password the client gives you and then you use that to log in to the LDAP server. Yes. The other way is that you use a constant like login yeah, and then you fetch. No? We're doing Scram as a team. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let's listen to the talk. Oh. So, Scram has these benefits. It's more resistant to dictionary attacks. Uh, the reason for that is that the MD5 hash was just a simple, you know, you just compute one or, or two hashes. But the Scram specification, it, there's an option called the iteration count, so you, you, you compute like 4,000 Scram hashes just for, for guessing one password. So it's a lot more, it's a lot slower, it's a lot more expensive to compute, or, uh, which means that it's more expensive to launch a dictionary attack, of course. Also when you log in, there, it is actually more, um, takes a, lot, a little bit more CPU for, to log in, but it should be a problem for real applications. Um, then it's r resistant to the replay attacks because we use much, much longer uh, random strings as, the so, uh, as part of the authentication. And the third, third good thing is that with the Scram, you can no longer use the hash from the uh, out ID table to log in. So you can't, if you, st if you steal a backup and you get all the password hashes, you just can't use them to log, log in as any user. You can, you, you can then launch a dictionary attack to crack them, but that's a whole different story. Yes, question. Uh, no, well, launching a Postgres backend is pretty slow anyway. Uh, so this is probably like, this is definitely less than 100 milliseconds. Uh, I don't, it's probably five or 10, yeah. Uh, the iteration count uh, the, in, the, in the implementation, we fixed it at 4,096, which is the kind of the default recommended by the spec. Uh, but it, it's configurable in the sense that well, it's not configurable because we haven't exposed that as an option. But in the future, if this becomes an issue, you can just bump up the count to make it more expensive. Or if you know that you're generating your passwords completely randomly, then you don't actually need the iteration count because um, it's just to defeat dictionary attacks. But if, you compu if your passwords are completely random, there is no, there's no need to make that part expensive. So you could actually lower the iteration count all the way down to one. But the, we haven't exposed that as an option. <coughs> so, Scram is a, it's a pretty simple implementation. It's about under 1,000 lines of code in libpq. Uh, with the caveat that there's some pretty large tables to do Unicode normalization uh, of the passwords, which was, uh, well, it's, it's a nice feature, I guess, but it, and it, I would not have implemented that except that it's mandated by the spec. So. Uh, felt like we should, uh, but the actual algorithm is is very simple. It's 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 you need you only need the SHA two five six hash algorithm uh, and 
the computations using that are very simple. Uh, compared to some other algorithms, like if we wanted to use, I mean, there's algorithms that use RSA, RSA style uh, public key encryption or something like that. That requires a lot more comp complicated computations or libraries to deal with big numbers or integers and such. None of that required by Scram. So the password verifiers look a little bit like this. Well, well this is how you, this is how you, uh, if you want to switch over to Scram, this is how you would do it. You would set password encryption option to uh, Scram SHA-256. This is really just a prelude to this slide, which shows what, the, what we store in the PG out ID table for each of these, these users. The first option isn't actual. I just only now realized that this slide is up, out of date. We don't allow that first option anymore. Uh, as part of the cleanup work after the scram, we removed the option to store the passwords in plain text, so you can't do that first one actually anymore. Uh, but it shows you the, what the scram verifier looks looks like in in the table. Uh, it begins with the scram SHA-256, and then there's the iteration count, and then there's um, the hashes themselves that are used as part of the protocol. Um, if you, if you, if in your MD5, if you, if in your HBA.conf file, if you say MD5, as as you always did, uh, then it will it's backward compatible in the sense that if if a user has an MD5 hash stored in 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 the database, and that that user tries to log in, then it, we will do MD5 authentication as as we always did. But the, if the user has a scram verifier uh, in the table then we'll do scram authentication. So that's the backward compatible option. If you set authentication method to MD5, then we'll do MD5 or scram depending on the user and what kind of a password the user has. If you set the, the method to scram SHA-256 in hba.conf, then we will actually reject anyone. Then the user that doesn't have a scr scram verifier <laughs> stored that still has an MD5 password, they can't log in. <laughs> Question? Yes. You can only have one password for one user. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. So <laughs> un, un, until all of your clients support Scram, you're probably stuck with MD5. Okay. Or you create a different role for them. Uh, that yeah, would work. No, it, yeah. it can't fall back from Scram to MD5, right? It can't. If you have a Scram verifier. Right. A user only has a Scram verifier, or you have an MD5 hash. And that dictates what authentication method you're, you're going to use. I don't have for to this. hack the HBA file. I just have to set their scram thing. Yeah, so you, you can just all, in your hba.conf file, you can just always keep using MD5. And for any user that then has a scram verifier, you'll get scram authentication. But if there's users that still, use, that still have a MD5 hash, they will use MD5. Uh, probably get, gets quite complicated if you try to migrate piecemeal, so it's probably better to wait until all your clients have the support and then switch the flag and reset all users' passwords. <laughs> That's what I would recommend to do in yeah. practice, although you can, you, know, you can try to be smart about it. So one thing uh, we did as part of this implementation work is uh, Scram is um, it's defined as a, a SASL authentication mechanism. Uh, SASL is a, it's another standard for, or as the RFC says, it's a framework for providing authentication method mechanisms in the connection-oriented protocols. Now, libpq protocol would be one of those connection-oriented protocols, and uh, SCRAM is one of the mechanisms. At first, when I was reading the SASL spec, I was kind of, I was a bit confused because I didn't understand what, what the point is. The SASL itself doesn't really define anything at all. It says that there's these authentication mechanisms and you have to go elsewhere to look up what they are. And it also says that there's these connection-oriented protocols like libpq is one of them, and it's up to you to decide how these protocols work. 
And I was like kind of confused, what exactly does SASL specify then? Even if it just leaves everything up to the mechanism or the protocol, but it's actually pretty clever. Uh, it, it says, if you're implementing Scram in a client, you don't need to worry about this, but it was a good framework for, it made you think about what, what these messages are that you're sending between the client and the server, and the, you have to define how you implement then in your protocol, which would be libpq in this case. And uh, in theory, you could then plug in any authentication mechanism into that framework, or you could use any authentication mechanism with any connection or the protocol, uh, which is a pretty cool concept. Now in Postgres, there isn't any library support or anything. It's just all implemented built in, but it's, uh, we could easily add more in the future if, if, if we need to. Um, we could have re redefined our MD5 authentication method as, one, as a SASL mechanism if we felt like it, but it would be a bit pointless because the whole point of keeping the support is to, for backwards compatibility, and we would break that. Uh, so Postgres only has support for Scram SHA-256 as a SASL mechanism, but it would be straightforward now to add, add new ones, and there is some uh, simple support for negotiating the mechanism now, so when we add more, uh, the client and the server can actually negotiate which one to use. Uh, we could, in the future, add, start using a library like Cyrus, Lib, Sassel, or there's probably others that provide support for more authentication mechanisms and not have to implement them from scratch in Postgres, which would be pretty cool. Uh, Sassel also, in, in some languages, at, at least Java, I know that there's a generic SASL interface thing like there is for many things in Java. <laughs> you just have, to have a bunch of interfaces and you implement your provider for them. Uh, so in theory, you not sure how the Java implementation is going to actually work for Postgres. Uh, but there is, a, there is a set of interfaces to implement these SASL mechanisms. And if there is an existing one for Scram, then you could just use that. Ah, oh, yeah, there you are. So how's that? Are you using these provider APIs in the so Java? at the beginning I had the same problem as you, like they looked at the SASL and say, does this work for anything? Uh, and I didn't care about it at the beginning, so yeah. uh, I kind of did the, the current implementation doesn't use the SASL Java APIs, Java SASL interfaces. Doesn't use it? No. no okay. uh, because they seem to provide nothing. Uh, now after seeing it a little bit more, it looks like it might have something into it, also for the client. Uh, so I will add a second like client, which will be a SASL compatible client using the Java SASL APIs. Now the resulting API it's much more difficult to use than the current one. So the current one is very clean. This one is very cumbersome to use. Now it has an advantage because if you implement the SASL version one, you'll be able to switch authentication mechanisms more easily. So yeah. That's the point of it. Yeah. So. Um, as, as you know, the Java, current Java implementation is based on an external library built for this purpose, for supporting Scrum. will provide its own Scrum client and a SASL compatible client. Cool. Yeah. So, the, yeah, the SASL specification is kind of funny because it really just says that the authentication happens as a challenge response thing. Your client sends a message to the server and the server responds. And there is a number of these interactions. And your protocol has to define how you carry these messages. And the mechanism has to define what's in the messages. <laughs> it's kind of super generic. Uh, but it, it, it's, a, it's actually a good one. <laughs> so in Postgres 10, there is a, we implement Scrum 256. That's what this is all about. Uh, some little uh, deviations or from the spec. Uh, we don't support what the spec set, uh Spec uh, specifies a concept called channel binding. We haven't implemented that yet. I mean, it's an optional part, so that's fine. There, yes, Mikhail Pakir posted a patch yesterday, was it? Or yeah, so there is now a patch for that. <laughs> well, so it looks like we're going to get that for the next version. Uh, so channel binding, yeah. Channel binding means that as part of the, when you calculate the hashes, we would you would also, uh, it has to do with SSL. You have, it's, it's only applicable if you're using, also using SSL. The idea is that 
you incorporate the SSL handshake messages as part of the hash. It means that if, the, if there's someone trying to do a man-in-the-middle attack so that you connect with SSL to a, man in the server in the middle and you have a different connection, different SSL connection to the real server, uh, that won't work. Uh, so it, it validates that you know it's just a single connection between single SSL connection between the client and the server. So with that, you would no longer need to use SSL certificates to, um, to, to or you could replace SSL certificates with that. Uh, so that would be pretty cool, and uh, hopefully we'll get that for Postgres 11. Um, another little thing that is kind of uh, compliant to the spec as far as I can tell, but we always pass an empty string as the username in the, in the, in the handshake. The reason for that is that we already sent the username earlier when the, f when, when the client connects to the server. The very first thing that the client sends is what we call a startup packet, which includes the username and it includes the database you're connecting to and some can, there can be other options. Uh, so this sending the username as part of the scram handshake would be redundant. And uh, well, why don't, I mean, what, what would be the harm with that is that the scram specification says that the username has to be in UTF-8 encoding. And uh, Postgres is more flexible than that. The username can be in any encoding. It's actually not well defined what encoding it is in. Um, so it's better to just always leave it empty. And we, the server will interpret empty as meaning use the one from the startup packet. So how do you migrate to Scram? Uh, the way to do that would be to upgrade all of your clients. You have to make sure that your client the drivers uh, are, if you're using libpq or psql, you upgrade the client so that it's at least version Postgres 10. Uh, if you're using some other driver like Java or, or something else, make sure that they have added support for Scram. And after that, you can set password encryption option in uh, the postgresql.conf file uh, to scram. And uh, well, that in itself won't really do anything. But the next time someone changes their password, they will get a uh, scram hash instead of an MD5 hash. Uh, you can look at the PG out ID table to see how many of your users already have MD5 hashes or still have MD5 hashes and how many have already migrated over. That's, the, that's how you basically do it. Um, you can try to be clever about it and keep one user still using the MD5 or something, but it's probably easiest to just do a um, wholesale migration. Hopefully, all of the clients will catch up and implement, implement Scram soon. Uh, Scram doesn't do encryption. It's good to keep that in mind. So you will still want to use SSL um, to protect your data. I mean, once you're authenticated, even if that's secure, uh, you would still be, you still don't want to send all your data in plain text. And uh, also because of the issues we talked about earlier that libpq won't actually, there's no option to force it to use Scram. Uh, so you'll want to still want to use SSL to make sure that you connect to the right server, which means you, in Postgres 10, you still do want to use a certificate um, and use SSL mode verify uh, full. Um, in the future, um, I think the next step is really to get all the different clients up to date. Uh, Alvaro has been working on the JDBC driver. I wrote the quick patch for the Go driver myself. Uh, it's the first, first piece of Go code I've written. Uh, hopefully that will get merged to the Go driver soon. Uh, but there's probably others that I'm not aware of. There's Python, various Python drivers, .NET Ruby. Uh, hopefully all of those will get updated fairly quickly. Uh, it's a very simple algorithm. It's a simple protocol. If you're, if you're using any of these drivers, it would be, now would be a good chance to uh, help and contribute and add support to these uh, driver projects. Another thing that was brought up yesterday by Tatsuo Ishii, who's the author of PG Pool, and I also spoke to others on, on PG Bouncer. They actually make, take advantage of the MD5 feature that if you grab the just MD5 hash from the database, you can use that to log in. Um, so PGPool actually takes advantage of that in that um, 
if the client authenticates the PG pool, the PG pool will need to authenticate to the backend multiple times or to different backends. And uh, there's no way to ask the client to authenticate again. Uh, so what it will do, it will fetch your password from the server and use that to log in. Uh, now with Scram, you can't do that anymore. It is effectively a man in the middle attack, but they're taking, yeah. It's a good man in the middle and not an attack in this case. Uh, but they will need to do something about that. Or maybe the solution is simply to just, <laughs> well, maybe it is an attack. <laughs> maybe the solution is to just not use Scram between PG pool and, and the actual servers. Um, it's, that's probably the solution, at least in the short term. There's really no way around that because Scram is by design <laughs> doesn't let you do that. Um, yeah, I believe it's a problem for PG Bouncer as well. Yeah. So, to provide, I mean, you could in theory extend the process so that the PG pool could say, I'm the PG pool and I need to authenticate four times. Oh, yeah, I suppose. And, and the client would have to be willing to know that it's willing to do that, right? I suppose that would be a harder protocol break, but yeah. Another solution would be. Actually, the Scram specification, or SASL even, has, has a concept of an authorization ID, which is different from the authentication ID. So you could, you could give PG pool just a single username and password and uh, have some kind of another config option that says that, you know, you can use this username and password to authenticate us, this, 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 and this user. Uh, so it could maybe defeat it that way. But Well, you, you can relay it once, uh, but uh, the libbq client will only do authentication in the beginning. Once you've already authenticated, the server can't ask you to authenticate again. Uh, but PG pool, it could do that for the first time, but then if the, uh, if the server goes down, for example, or you want to do load balancing, it needs to connect to multiple servers and um, open multiple connections for one connection from the client. One could one, one to one you could do, yeah. Channel, Channel Biden, Biden would defeat <laughs> that too, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Indeed. There are nonces sent as part of the process. So each time there's a new authentication, there's a new nonce. Even if the client would send the same one, the server would append a new one. It, it seems like these new authentication protocols are making it much harder to fool clients and to believe that they're not server when they're Yeah, gee. <laughs> It is a disadvantage, I suppose, <laughs> if you look at it that way, yeah. But I mean, the real solution is to just not use Scram between your pooler and the, and the backend. Oh yeah, that, yeah, that's the other option. It could ask the client for the plain test password and then use that to do whatever it wants. <laughs> or its own file, yeah. then that defeats that too, yes. Yeah, it needs some backend support. I mean, that we, have, we don't have a concept of that, that kind of a thing in Postgres. Um, well, kind of, I, guess, I suppose. It's my yeah. Name. Yeah. yeah, so maybe, maybe do something like that. Well, patches are welcome. So the kind of the obvious next thing also would be to add an option to libpq to tell it to not give away the password to anyone who asks, basically. Uh, we, I mean, traditionally we've cared a lot about securing the server, but not so much about making sure that the client knows who it's talking to. I mean, if you use, that's what SSL certificates are used for today, but it would be nice to take advantage of the Scram feature that you can you wouldn't need to do that. And channel binding. Uh, other other long, longer term stuff, I actually spoke to Eisentrad today, Peter Eisentrad today, about you could store Scram verifiers in an LDAP server. So currently, if you do LDAP authentication in Postgres, we always send the password in plain text, but it wouldn't need to be that way. You could um, store a Scram verifier in the LDAP server and still do Scram authentication from the client to the Postgres server. 
And uh, yeah, we could do something about the delegation issue with, with PG pool and, and such. Another really cool, cool thing in the world of authentication is uh, what's called a zero knowledge proof. Uh, so Scram still has this feature that, or, or flaw, that if someone records your handshake, they can use that information to launch a dictionary attack, uh, which is okay, ish, if you have a good enough passwords. I mean, then then you can't guess them. Uh, but there are there are there are multiple protocols out there that that are even better than that. In, for example, I looked at SRP um, protocol for a long time. Considered if we should do that instead of Scram. Uh, it has the property that if someone eavesdrops your authentication they can't use that to launch a dictionary attack, which means that you can use very weak passwords and it's kind of okay, as long as you don't let the client to try too often. And if you limit, so if you rate limit your uh, password attempts, um, you could use, you know, relatively weak passwords and uh, that would be okay. That would be really cool for, for the case that a human being chooses its own password. Um, People are usually not very good at choosing good passwords that don't fall for dictionary attacks. Uh, but that's that, that algorithm and other similar zero-knowledge zero proof algorithms are more complicated, so they would need um, more libraries for dealing with big integers and doing exponentiation and, and so forth. So I decided that it's better to go with Scram, which is a well-known protocol and very simple to implement, so maybe we'll actually get the support into all of these Java and uh, Python and all these drivers, and that's already a lot better than, than MD5. Um, that's really all I have to say. More questions? Yes? So the interface on the CPU is the same, so if I have an application like a each driver that takes the password, shoves it into libpq, and that just works? Yeah, yeah, any driver that uses libpq, like ODBC these days, uh, it will it will just work. Yes. Uh, there was a change to the, the or addition to the libpq. Um, there's a new function added to libpq for changing your password. Uh, because there's a, there's a function you can use to compute the MD5 hash. We basically added a new one that you can use to create a compute a scram hash uh, if you want to change your password without sending it in plain text in your you know, alter user set password command. Uh, but that's, most clients don't do that. That's for PC cool uses that, but there's probably not many others. More questions? No? Jumping would get you to write more patches that are as cool as this patch. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> If I get more money, I'll just go on a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.